Good morning. I'm Raleigh Flynn, the president of the Foreign Policy Research Institute. Uh, this morning, we have a real treat. We have the preeminent historian, um, Professor John H. Maurer, who is also a senior fellow in FPRI's program on national security and a member of Orbis, our uh, scholarly journal. Uh, he's a member of our board of editors. Um, he'll be talking about his new book, which is coming out in 2022, called Great Power War in Asia, The Road to War to Pearl Harbor. Um, this is, uh, promises to be a really, really terrific discussion this morning, terrific uh, talk this morning. Um, here we are, it's 80 years since the United States was attacked on December 7th. We're, I guess, two days after that anniversary, but still it's timely. Um, the book, in addition to, um, to uh, John's chapters and some of the other preeminent author, authors also features a chapter by Pulitzer Prize winning historian and chair of FDR's board of advisor, Walter McDougall, who wrote a chapter for the book on FDR and America's road to war in the Pacific. Um, I wanna let you know that that chapter is available for you to read and there's a link or will be shortly if there isn't one yet in the chat window so you can access that. We also have in the chat window a link to John Maurer's um, Orbis 2012 article, uh, A Rising Naval Challenger in Asia, Lessons from Britain and Japan Between the Wars. So um, uh, this will just be a little bit of a teaser for uh, the book that's going to be coming out next year. So you can access those two chapters. Um, I know many of you are familiar with uh, Professor Moore, but let me just give you a little bit on his background. He serves as the Alfred Thayer Mahan Presser, uh, Professor of Sea Power and Grand Strategy at the Naval War College. And uh, he serves as one of the lead professors in the college's advanced strategy program. He's a graduate of Yale College and holds an MALD and PhD in international relations from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts. Um, he's also the author or editor of books which have examined the outbreak of the First World War, military interventions in the developing world, naval rivalries, and arms control between the two world wars, a study on Winston Churchill, British grand strategy, and it goes on and on. And so this is just the latest in a distinguished career to uh, have this um, this book coming out. And uh, last but certainly not least, he started his career as an intern at FPRI, so we're exceedingly proud of that. Uh, before I turn it over to him, I just want to say one quick uh, note on an upcoming event, Tuesday, December 14th from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. Uh, we're going to be talking with uh, Parag Khanna as part of Ron Granieri's series, um, uh, people, Politics, and Prose, and Prague's going to be talking about his new book, Move, The Forces of Rooting Us, uh, talking about the new age of mass migrations. It should be a really interesting conversation. And last, uh, as I turn it over to, to uh, John, uh, just let you know, uh, his talk may run a little long, and um, he says about 50 minutes or so, um, but in order to accommodate your questions, we're willing to stay on a little past our hour, so just be aware of that, uh, that, that we will do that. Uh, and finally, let me thank our members and supporters for their generous uh, support of FPRI. We couldn't do it without you. Um, so without further ado, uh, I'll turn it over to John Maurer. Uh, thank you very much, Raleigh, for that, uh, that introduction. Uh, as you mentioned, I started as an intern between my undergraduate and graduate years as an intern uh, uh, in 1976 uh, with the Foreign Policy Research Institute. It was a wonderful experience. So much so that after I finished graduate school, I came back to work uh, at FPRI during the 1980s. And again, a wonderful experience at, at that time, working with a first class institute in the Foreign Policy Research Institute. Well, let me share my screen and put up some PowerPoint um, uh, 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 for uh, my talk today. And uh, in my talk today, I'm going to focus on uh, President Roosevelt uh, and Roosevelt's decisions 
and how the U.S. Uh, became involved in a war with uh, Japan, and then the wider war with Nazi Germany. Uh, the perspective that I'm giving is that of context, overall context of high politics, grand strategy. That's what my talk is about. It's not about a detailed account of the attack on Pearl Harbor. It's a background on how Pearl Harbor, how the U.S. Uh, suffered that defeat at Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941, and entered into the Second World War. Um, I also want to uh, say something in addition to what uh, Raleigh had to say about the book. Uh, next year, uh, this book is going to be coming out. Uh, it has Walter in it. It also has Eric Goldstein, my co-editor uh, uh, from Boston University, uh, involved. We have chapters on uh, uh, President Roosevelt. We have a chapter on Chiang Kai-shek. We have a chapter on Winston Churchill. We also have a chapter that looks at the end at current um, uh, contest between China, the US and Japan today. Uh, so uh, this book was sponsored by the Foreign Policy Research Institute, again, showing how much the Foreign Policy Research Institute is involved in promoting the study of history uh, and also its application for thinking about uh, today's uh, current problem. So Raleigh, thank you to FPRI and the FPRI team for supporting uh, this book uh, project. Well, in talking about Franklin D. Roosevelt, it's important to go back and look at his personal history uh, to his apprenticeship. Uh, and here you see uh, President, future President Roosevelt, Franklin D. Roosevelt, at the age of 31 in 1913. In 1913, he became Assistant Secretary of the Navy, the number two civilian position in the Navy Department in the administration of Woodrow Wilson. Roosevelt's background as Assistant Secretary of the Navy is part of his preparation for future leadership, for his understanding of strategy, for his understanding of world politics, for his understanding of the role of navies and armies, uh, of how they are used to wage war. He was Secretary of the Navy throughout the period from 1913 through the First World War. As Assistant Secretary of the Navy, he presided over, uh, helped guide the large buildup of American naval power that took place during the First World War. Woodrow Wilson's administration was a major turning point in American naval and international history. Not only did the United States send a large army to Europe in 1917 and 18, but also build up a great navy in this time. Woodrow Wilson wanted to build incomparably the greatest navy in the world, he said. Uh, in other words, a navy to rival that of the leading naval power, Great Britain. And Franklin D. Roosevelt in the Navy Department helped to preside over that buildup. Now, when Franklin D. Roosevelt was asked to serve as Assistant Secretary of the Navy, another Roosevelt, a relation of his, none other than Theodore Roosevelt, wrote him a note. Theodore Roosevelt was the uncle of, uh, of uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt's wife, Eleanor. And uh, Theodore Roosevelt wrote, enjoy yourself to the full as Assistant Secretary of the Navy. Theodore Roosevelt had been Assistant Secretary of the Navy at the time leading up to the Spanish-American War in 1898 as Assistant Secretary of the Navy during the McKinley administration. It goes on to say, enjoy yourself to the full you will do capital work. I just love that use of the adjective uh, capital there. A capital is an adjective. That's not used anymore. We, we, don't, we don't say uh, uh, use that word capital. I wish we would bring that back into our uh, vocabulary. I think it would be a capital idea to do so. Um, well, uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt did enjoy himself as well as work very hard and be very successful and competent as Assistant Secretary of the Navy. Here you see him in March of 1913 in Brooklyn for the keel laying of the battleship Arizona. And there you see Franklin D. Roosevelt there with the crowd behind as the battleship Arizona is started. Uh, two years later, the battleship Arizona is launched into the East River. You can see the Brooklyn Bridge uh, behind. And after that, the uh, Arizona is commissioned into the Navy. Again, Roosevelt has experience with the buildup of American naval power uh, in this time. The battleships that are going to be at Pearl Harbor are battleships that were largely built. Most of them were built 
uh, or started at least during the time that Franklin D. Roosevelt was Assistant Secretary of the Navy. Well, what about the Pacific? Uh, war between Japan and the United States? Were they destined for war, these two great powers of the Pacific? Um, at the beginning of the 20th century, it looked like they did seem to be destined. In 1906-7 and also in 1913, uh, there were two war scares uh, that looked like Japan and the United States might go to war with each other. Uh, this was something very much in the minds of American decision makers, that Japan was seen as a rival in the Pacific, that Japan had imperial ambitions in Asia and the Pacific that were contrary to America's aims in the, in the Pacific and in Asia, and that these could explode into war. So Franklin D. Roosevelt is very much aware of these confrontations between Japan and the US. Now, these earlier confrontations in 1906 and 7, during the administration of Theodore Roosevelt, uh, and in 1913, during the Wilson administration, they are negotiated away. Uh, there's political solutions uh, to this. Neither side wants to have war. Uh, both sides are willing to accommodate each other and compromise with each other. Uh, so as a consequence, while there had been two crises in Japanese-American relations, they had been settled without war. Um, fast forward to the 1920s after the First World War. As we know, in 1921, uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt was stricken with polio. Uh, and here's a photograph of him swimming in Warm Springs, Georgia in the middle of the 1920s. Uh, uh, it looked like his political career was going to come to an end. His mother uh, thought that he should give up on politics and just focus on trying to manage and recover from uh, the affliction of polio. Uh, uh, he found, though, that he could regain his strength uh, by physical exercise, in particular swimming. He liked swimming. And not only was it good for uh, his physical well-being, uh, but also also for his mental well-being as well. And so he uh, came to the conclusion that despite the, the ravages of polio, that he could continue with a political uh, career. And he wanted to stay in the limelight. Uh, he's an up-and-coming figure uh, in American politics, someone who has experience of executive office in government and also a wider experience of the world and of matters dealing with grand strategy. Well, in 1923, as he's recovering from uh, polio, uh, uh, he writes an article in the journal Asia. And as you can see here, the front first page of the article, it's entitled, Shall We Trust Japan? Uh, so Roosevelt is writing, burnishing his reputation as a leader who is not only focused on domestic politics, but can talk authoritatively about international affairs. And in this article, uh, Roosevelt writes, again, this is 1923, says the principal causes of friction that had led to these earlier crises between Japan and the United States, they're on the road to being removed or eventual elimination. In other words, these two great powers of the Pacific uh, can sort out their disagreements and accommodate each other. There is no cause here that's going to lead to war. Uh, again, the road is not toward Pearl Harbor, but toward peace. Uh, several years later, in 1928, Roosevelt again writes another article, and this is in the uh, journal Foreign Affairs, uh, published, as you know, by the Council of Foreign Relations in New York. Uh, and uh, 1928 is an election year. It's a presidential election year. Herbert Hoover is running against uh, Al Smith of New York. Uh, what Roosevelt is tasked to do is to write an article that if Al Smith wins the presidency, what will be the foreign policy of a democratic administration? And so, as you can see, the title of the article is Our Foreign Policy, A Democratic View. If the Democrats win, this is what America's foreign policy will be, as opposed to a Republican uh, point of view. Uh, by the way, uh, in 1928, the Republicans, of course, win big. Hoover wins the presidency. The Republicans also win the House and Senate. They have a, a, a major electoral victory in 1928 in the national elections. That year in 1928, Roosevelt was running to be governor of New York, uh, the largest, most populous state in the Union at that time. Uh, he bucks the Republican trend. He is elected to be governor of New York in 1928. So even though the Democrats uh, are defeated overall in the national elections, he nonetheless wins as governor of New York. 
uh, again, a, a pretty impressive achievement given the Republican wave of 1928. Well, uh, in this article, Roosevelt says that only paranoid, excited admirals um, envision in somehow seriously that uh, a war could happen between the US and Japan. As he says, that either the United States or Japan will invade each other by sea. Again, this is 1928. Now we know the history. We know that Roosevelt will be president in 1941 and through the Second World War, where uh, Japan attacks us in Hawaii, but also we plan for the invasion of Japan by sea. Now, I, you look at this and you say, oh my goodness, Roosevelt's crystal ball is pretty cloudy that he couldn't see that, oh, within a little more than 10 years uh, uh, that the United States would be at war with Japan and working toward the invasion of the Japanese home islands. Well, again, to give him his due, remember the 1920s are an age of a booming economy in the US and overall the international economy is recovering from the First World War. And so it looks in the 1920s as if uh, the great powers are going to cooperate with each other. They're not on some inevitable path toward war. There's no trap that they're springing for each other. Uh, war can be avoided. The great powers understand from the lesson of the First World War that great powers don't benefit by great power wars. So in the 1920s, uh, Roosevelt's view is one of optimism. And oh, by the way, it's shared by many around the world, including Winston Churchill, who at the same time is saying that there shouldn't be a war with Japan. So Roosevelt's view is very much in the mainstream, uh, mainstream at that time. Well, we know what happens. We know the history. The Great Depression, beginning in October 1929 with the stock market crash on Wall Street, this leads to a radicalization of politics. The Great Depression afflicts not just the US, this economic catastrophe doesn't just hurt Americans. It spreads around the world. Uh, it's a global depression that happens, a big slump. And the result of this is that countries hit hard by the depression. Uh, uh, their politics becomes radicalized, polarized. And what you see in two major powers, two great powers, Germany and Japan, this radicalization leads to authoritarian governments. Democratic experiment, both in Germany and Japan, the Weimar Republic in Germany, uh, the party governments uh, of Japan of the 1920s, uh, that is all dashed. The result is that because of the Great Depression, what you see in Germany is the collapse of democracy. The Weimar Republic goes down. And on January 30th, 1933, Hitler comes to power in Germany. Hitler would never have come to power without the Great Depression. In Japan, you see a radicalization that takes place as well in uh, Japanese politics, a militarization of Japanese society and politics. And this leads to Japan being much more aggressive, aggressive on the world stage. Well, in the United States, uh, we're familiar with the newsreels and the photographs of the Great Depression of hungry men wearing clothing that's threadbare, uh, looking for a place to sleep, uh, looking for food, a handout. Uh, uh, these uh, people not only uh, wanting destitute in a material way, they're also having their spirits crushed by the high unemployment, the poverty that is brought about by the great crash. Uh, and here you see a uh, statues at the FDR Memorial in Washington, D.C., which is a wonderful memorial and well worth visiting on your next trip to uh, Washington. Uh, and you see uh, uh, these statues represent film footage, uh, photographs of uh, the crash and its impact on Americans. Well, the uh, crash uh, brought about a change in American politics too. In 1932, Franklin D. Roosevelt runs for the presidency and handily beats Herbert Hoover. Hoover was seen as a failure in response to the Great Depression. And here you see a photograph that is typical of Roosevelt in this time. And you see that big grin that he has on his face. Uh, the cigarette and the uh, cigarette holder there looking out. Again, optimism, optimism. Americans could overcome the Great Depression. Uh, good times, happy times will come about again and the hard times will uh, be over. Again, Roosevelt is elected uh, to get America out of that Great Depression, to restore America's economy, but also to restore 
Americans' confidence in themselves. Um, here you see uh, Roosevelt on the bridge uh, of uh, a cruiser taking a salute in May of 1934 of a big fleet review, a parade of the American battle fleet in New York Harbor. And you see here the president, the center, uh, to one side is his wife, Eleanor, uh, to the other side is his mother, Sarah Delano Roosevelt. Behind him is one of Roosevelt's sons and uh, daughter-in-law. Uh, he is on board the bridge of the cruiser Indianapolis as he reviews, as he reviews the American fleet go by him in New York Harbor. Uh, you might know about the cruiser in Indianapolis. Uh, the story of the cruiser in Indianapolis was popularized in the movie Jaws. The cruiser in Indianapolis carried uh, a nuclear weapon out to the Pacific that would be used against Japan in 1945. After it carried out that mission, it was attacked and sunk by a Japanese submarine. Uh, the crew of the Indianapolis uh, had to go into the sea. Uh, and while awaiting rescue, they were attacked uh, by sharks. It's a horrific story. Uh, but here you see Roosevelt on the bridge of the Indianapolis. Part of the recovery from the Great Depression was the government uh, uh, doing jobs programs, infrastructure today we would call, uh, to put people back to work, the federal government engaging in programs to uh, uh, cure unemployment, to bring down unemployment. And one of the ways the government was to spend money was on the Navy. Roosevelt, uh, former assistant secretary of the Navy, seeing himself as a Navy man, uh, wanted to build warships as a way to curing unemployment, uh, putting people to work in uh, the uh, maritime shipbuilding uh, industries. Uh, so the Great Depression helps to uh, build up American naval power tentatively in the early 30s. Well, the 1930s are very different from the 1920s. If the 1920s are a period of international co uh, cooperation among the great powers, the 1930s is what we today would call a return to intense uh, great power competition with the danger of war. Uh, in Japan, as I mentioned before, Japan society and government are militarized at this time. Leaders who want to uh, avoid conflict with the United States, with Britain, want to uh, uh, avoid conflict in Asia. Uh, those leaders are silenced, some of them by assassination. One Japanese prime minister is, uh, is cut down in the Tokyo railway station. Uh, a Japanese finance minister who was very friendly toward the United States and Britain wanted to promote economic co cooperation and hold down Japanese defense budget. He is brutally murdered in his bed. Uh, as a consequence, leaders who stand against a tide of ultra-nationalist uh, 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 views of military leaders and society are either cut down or are intimidated and no longer having say in the Japanese government. Uh, the New York Times correspondent in uh, Tokyo during this period of time, the 1930s, wrote about what he saw. And he entitled the book, the book came out in 1942 after Pearl Harbor. The title of the book was Government by Assassination. And so that label has stuck uh, in, uh, in our minds about what's going on in Japan, this radicalization that's taking place in Japan at this time. Now, now what I like about this, and I like to joke about this, is that here you have a journalist whose name is Bias, a biased journalist writing about Japan. This book, by the way, is very good and it is worth uh, reading uh, to get that first hand of view of what's going on, what he witnessed in Japan uh, during uh, the 1930s and the run up to Pearl Harbor. Well, part of the militarization of Japan at this time, as you can see, here's the Emperor Hirohito on his horseback, bedecked in medals, riding a white horse. When you see an emperor on a white horse immediately, you think of Napoleon, you think about aggressive behavior uh, in international re uh, relations. And so that is what's going on here. Uh, uh, the, the head, uh, uh, the uh, leader of Japan, its emperor, uh, is seems to also represent this ultra-nationalist view uh, that Japan has to expand that it has to become an even greater power on the world stage. And that means confrontation with other countries. This is a very different outlook from the 1920s, by the way, where Hirohito was envisioning that the Japanese monarchy would become more like the British monarchy. And of course, after the 
a Second World War. That's the role that Hirohito would play. And some of us might remember in the early 1970s when Hirohito came to the United States, went to Disneyland, uh, highly uh, uh, a choreographed public relations tour uh, to try to put the Second World War behind the American and Japanese people, going to Disneyland and, and getting a Mickey Mouse watch. That's a very different Hirohito of the 1970s from the Hirohito of the 1930s. Hirohito is a very controversial figure nowadays. Uh, should he have been branded as a war criminal? Uh, we decided not to do that after the defeat, uh, after Japan's surrender, because we saw Hirohito could be a force for stability uh, within Japan uh, to help in the occupation, but also the reconstruction of Japan uh, uh, after the Second World War. Well, uh, Japan is on the march. In 1910, they had annexed Korea into the Japanese Empire. In 1931, a Japanese army takes over Manchuria. Manchuria is in the northeast of China. Uh, it's part, considered part of China. Japan takes over this region. This region is rich in coal and in iron deposits. Of course, if you have coal and iron, you can make steel. And Japan wants this area because of the natural resources in it will make Japan a stronger, a greater great power. And so uh, Japan wants this region. Now, of course, to a Chinese nationalist, uh, th this is to rip apart China, uh, to partition China. And so for Chinese nationalists, this is uh, something that is an anathema to them. Also, it violates uh, treaties that Japan had signed uh, uh, earlier to maintain the territorial integrity of China. And so the United States opposes this. The League of Nations condemns it. Uh, even though the U.S. is not part of the League of Nations at this time, uh, the United States nonetheless is opposed to this. And uh, Secretary of State uh, Stimson uh, authors what is known today as the Stimson Doctrine, which is we won't recognize that. Uh, we can't do anything about it. Uh, we won't go to war against Japan to roll it back, but uh, we won't recognize this Japanese conquest and establishment of a puppet state. Well, uh, over time, uh, Japanese behavior in China escalates until a full-scale war erupts between China and Japan. This is referred to as the Second Sino-Japanese War of 1937 to 1945. Now note, 1937 is when this fighting begins. By the time of Pearl Harbor, Japan has been fighting against China for four years. Keep that in mind. The war in Asia doesn't start uh, at Pearl Harbor. It's already started four years before uh, when Japan and China come to blows. Japan thought it could gain a quick victory in this war. It turns out that they can't win a quick victory. Another thing to note, this is the second Sino-Japanese War. The first Sino-Japanese War was in 1894-95. Japan, Imperial Japan, fought Imperial China and handily defeated Imperial China in that war. Uh, as part of the Japanese victory over China uh, in 1894-5, Taiwan became part of the Japanese Empire. So again, note, that from 1895 down to 1945, that 50 year period, Taiwan was part of the Japanese empire, not part of China. Important background for thinking about today uh, and uh, uh, Taiwan as part of a larger uh, China. For a long period over the last 100 plus years, Taiwan has been a part uh, from the rest of China, except for a, a brief period of time, mainland China, for a brief period of time from 1945 to 1949. Well, uh, Japanese war escalates, uh, becomes a major land war on the continent of Asia for Japan. Uh, when we're fighting Japan from 41 to 45, the Japanese army is largely tied down in China. We forget the role that China played in helping defeat Japan. It's of great importance because it ties down so much Japanese resources and manpower in this war. Nationalist China won't give up. They won't let them uh, give in. They won't give in 
to uh, Japanese aggression. The leader of nationalist China is Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek. Uh, again, he's the loser in the Chinese Civil War to Mao Zedong. But in this period of time, he's leading Chinese resistance against Japan, and he won't give up. He frustrates the Japanese. The Japanese respond by conducting a terror campaign against uh, uh, the Chinese people. While the Japanese win almost every battle, they're successful on the battlefield for the most part. Uh, they can't break the will of Chiang Kai-shek and the Chinese people uh, in this war who stay in the war. And we should recognize the role that China, nationalist China under Chiang Kai-shek played in the defeat of Japan. For Americans, newsreels were showing Japan's actions in China. And here you see a photograph taken from a newsreel that would have been broadcast, would have been shown in movie theaters around the United States. It shows a famous newsreel showing a crying abandoned baby in the bombed out Shanghai railway station. Over time, Americans looked at this, looked at what Japan was doing in China, and increasingly was siding with China against Japan. Important background for understanding American foreign policy in the late 1930s. Well, uh, this war between Japan and China that begins in 37, uh, Roosevelt, President Roosevelt, speaks out about it. Uh, on October 5th, 1937 in Chicago, he gives a very important speech about uh, what's going on in the world. And he compares, compares war with uh, an epidemic. That, and uh, he says that, as you can see here, there's an epidemic of lawlessness a breakdown of international order. This epidemic of uh, world lawlessness is expanding. It's growing just like a pandemic would, an epidemic does, it's spreading. And again, when it starts to spread, what does the community do? It joins in a quarantine. This speech is known as the quarantine speech because of what Roosevelt is saying here. Again, to protect the health of the international community, there should be a quarantine of this war in Asia to stop the spread of the disease. Again, war is a contagion, he says, and it can engulf people far removed from the original scene of where the fighting is. Now, most of the speech up to this point is not particularly controversial. It just warns America that there's wars and dangers of war out there and that they can spread these wars. Uh, here's where it gets controversial though. Roosevelt goes on to say, Americans shouldn't think that we are secure because we're the new world separated from the rest of the world by big oceans. What goes on in the old world is going to have an impact on America in the new world. Again, don't think that the wars that go on out there won't spread this international pandemic, won't come to the United States. As he says, that Americans can uh, expect mercy, that we will be somehow immune, immunized from this contagion because we have two big oceans on either side. Uh, 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 here's where it gets controversial because Americans are thinking, well, we're safe over here if we hunker down in hemispheric defense. Uh, what goes on in Asia and Europe can stay in Europe and Asia. It won't spread uh, to us. Well, Roosevelt goes on and says, don't think that we can live peacefully, that we can prosper, that our well-being and our freedoms will endure, uh, as he says here, enjoy, carry on the arts of civilization, if the rest of the world uh, is uh, being lit up by war, that this contagion has spread uh, uh, in Europe and Asia. It will come to the Western Hemisphere. The U.S. will be uh, uh, hit. There will be an impact on the U.S., uh, by these wars in Asia and in Europe. And this is controversial because what it's saying is the U.S. has to be engaged in this wider world at a time when many Americans didn't want to be engaged in the wider world. In the First World War, we sent over two million troops to France to fight against Germany. What was the result? Uh, uh, the world wasn't any peaceful as a consequence of that effort, sending Americans over there. Uh, instead, what did you get? Well, again, the 1930s, a stock market crash uh, and greater international danger. The First World War didn't solve anything. Let's not do that again. Let's not go over there. Let's instead stay safe here in our own hemisphere. So this is an attack that Roosevelt 
is launching against what is known as isolationism, uh, the refusal of Americans to engage in security commitments to other countries outside of the Western Hemisphere. Well, Hitler's war, not only is there a war in Asia that lights up in 1937, in 1939, September 1939, war erupts in Europe. Hitler attacks Poland, uh, his partner Stalin attacks Poland uh, from the east. The result is the partition of Poland. Uh, Britain and France had made a, a, a guarantee to Poland. And when Poland is attacked by Nazi Germany, Britain and France go to war against Nazi Germany. Here you see these two totalitarian states, Nazi Germany, Soviet Russia, Hitler and Stalin making a pact together. These two authoritarian powers don't like the international environment that's dominated by a democratic liberal world order. They see that democratic liberal world order as standing in their way of their ambitions, their imperial ambitions. And so uh, they are able to cooperate for a time. Um, with Poland gone in the spring of 1940, Hitler looks west to Western Europe. And in April of 1940, the Germans invade Denmark and Norway. And in May and June of 1940, they attack to the west uh, into the Netherlands, Belgium, and France. Um, what happens in France uh, is a big upset. No one expected that the Germans would win quickly. Uh, it was anticipated that uh, the next war, this war, would be like the last war, the Great War, the First World War. Yes, the Germans will attack into Belgium and France. They'll make some gains, but then the French army with their British allies will stop the German offensive before Paris, uh, hold the line, and then go on to the attack and throw the Germans back across the Rhine. Uh, the scenario of what had happened in the First World War, that um, the war would become stalemated, a war of attrition, uh, a war uh, in which France would hold on. Remember, again, in the First World War, the Germans launched repeated offensives on the Western Front in 1914, 1916, 1918. They hammered and hammered the French, and yet the French held on. The French did not give up. They did not fold. Again, there's an anticipation that that will happen again. Instead, what happens is the Germans break through the French lines, French, British, Belgian, Dutch lines, and are able to encircle and destroy large numbers of uh, French forces. The British are fortunate to get their army off the continent at Dunkirk. Uh, the Germans turn south. And so American newsreels are showing this, a German army marching down the Champs-Élysées, marching through uh, the Arc de Triomphe. And here you see again, these newsreels are on American movie screens. Germany is triumphant, France is beaten. What a surprise, this is upsetting. No one anticipated this. Hitler taking a tour of Paris, uh, the conquering hero of the German people, here humbling the French. Uh, again, this is a big turnaround that had been unanticipated. Well, with Europe, continental Europe, under the heel of Nazi Germany, Britain uh, has a choice. Should they stay in the war and fight, try to fight on, or should they try to come to an accommodation with the victorious Hitler? Should they negotiate with him a way out of the war? And there is a debate among Britain's leaders what to do. Should they open up negotiations with Hitler to try to bring to end a war that looks very difficult to imagine how Britain can be part, uh, can win against Nazi Germany? Or do they fight on? Well, we know the history of the story. Churchill had become prime minister just as the German offensive was beginning. And he rallied the British people. He rallied the British government and said in his speeches, we shall never surrender. And again, this resonated with the British people. You can see the tabloid uh, saying, uh, echoing Churchill's words. The British people rallied behind the British government and stayed in the war uh, in 1940. A big part, by the way, of Churchill's calculations that Britain can stay in the war was because he counted upon, hoped for, looked for, increasing American assistance to Britain in the war. Well, Britain stays in the war, but uh, Britain is punished for staying in the war. Germany unleashes an air offensive against the British to get air superiority to carry out a cross-channel attack, a Normandy invasion in reverse. 
Um, Britain has the world's best air defense network in 1940. Um, Britain is able in the Battle of Britain to uh, defeat the German effort to get air superiority to be able to do a cross-channel attack. However, despite the success in the Battle of Britain in beating back the German air onslaught, preventing Germany from getting air superiority over the channel in southern England, the bomber, the German bomber, can still get through. And here you see a photograph of a German bomber uh, unleashing its bomb load on to the British homeland. St. Paul's Cathedral, the area around it, heavily bombed by the Germans. Great deal of destruction. It was feared that the great dome, Christopher Wren's great dome, great architectural achievement, uh, would be destroyed by the bombing. Churchill and his government uh, made this a priority to prevent Wren's masterpiece from being destroyed by the German bombs, and it did indeed uh, survive. Um, Buckingham Palace was bombed in September of 1940. The king and queen were in the palace at the time, uh, not in a shelter when the bombs came down. Uh, and here you see King George VI and the queen uh, with Winston Churchill inspecting the bomb damage of Buckingham Palace. The king and the queen could have been killed uh, in September of 1940. Uh, the royal family, uh, however, mirrors or looks very much like the British people they are determined to fight on. Uh, and uh, Buckingham Palace is bombed, shows that it's not just the poorer sections, uh, the industrial sections that are being hit by German bombs, but also where the, the monarchy is as well. The monarchy, uh, because of its role in the Second World War, uh, uh, it gains a great deal of legitimacy and strength with the British people for the heroic defiance of the royal family against the uh, Nazis. In the spring of 1941, Parliament is bombed. The House of Commons is destroyed. The current House of Commons had to be rebuilt after the Second World War. And here you see Churchill and his advisor, Brendan Bracken, uh, inspecting the damage of the House of Commons. Uh, Britain holds on despite the bombing. Britain's war production increases uh, in the period of time under the bombing. Britain is able to mount a naval and air defense of the home islands uh, at this time. But it's important to recognize just uh, how much damage was done by Germany at this period of time during the Blitz. Between August 1940 and December 1940, 25, about 25,000 British civilians were killed by German bombing of uh, primarily urban areas uh, of uh, the United Kingdom. Again, to put that in some perspective, uh, that's the equivalent in loss of life of seven or eight September 11th attacks over a period of several months. That's the amount of damage that Britain is suffering, in loss of life and also of damage to their cities from the German bombing. Britain stays in the war, however, uh, and doesn't uh, give up. Well, um, again, the upset victory uh, of Germany over France uh, becomes a shock in the United States. Uh, Americans of all political stripes, isolationists, engagers, are all united that the U.S. has to increase dramatically its defense effort. What's going on in Asia and Europe is threatening our security here in our homeland, in the Western Hemisphere. So across the board, there is uh, support for a buildup of American military and naval power, conscription in peacetime to build up the armed forces and also to build up a huge navy to protect us, those two moats. We don't want those moats to become a highway for invaders. We want to be able to defend ourselves by having a two ocean navy. So what is set in train here is the beginnings, uh, the real beginnings of American rearmament, uh, a buildup of American military power. But of course, this is going to take several years to 1943-44 before these, uh, this buildup that's taking place uh, starting here in 1940 will start to uh, bear fruit. Uh, another impact on the U.S. is not just that Americans are aware that we have to build up our armed forces to protect ourselves. Uh, there's also a big political question. 1940 is a presidential election year. Should Franklin D. Roosevelt run for a third term? And remember, a tradition had been set by George Washington after two terms, he stepped down as president of the United States and went back to his farm. Uh, a tradition, not a law, a tradition had been set 
And, and so uh, would anyone, any political leader, any president want to run for a third term? Well, there were several presidents who thought about running for a third term. Ulysses S. Grant was one, Woodrow Wilson was another. Uh, but they both decided, or their parties, uh, in the case of Woodrow Wilson, decided that uh, it wasn't a good idea. And also Wilson's health was poor. Um, but, but by running for a third term, Roosevelt is putting himself up on a pedestal, in effect saying he's better than George Washington. Um, American people might not stand for that. And in the spring of 1940, Americans were polled and they were asked, should Roosevelt run for a third term? And the American people came back and said, no, no, Washington set a tradition, two terms are enough. The fall of France, however, changes things. It galvanizes the American people, makes them much more aware of the threats to their security. And they look around the political spectrum and say, who's the leader that we need at the time of crisis when the U.S. could be in a war? Well, it becomes clear to the American people when they look around, they say Franklin D. Roosevelt is the best person uh, to be our leader in a time of great war. And so uh, um, Roosevelt decides to run for a third term. Now, how do you get around this taboo uh, of uh, a third term? Well, what you do is you be drafted. Americans are going to be drafted. Young people are going to be drafted in the armed services. So what Roosevelt and uh, his party decide is, well, we'll portray it as that way too, that Roosevelt is being drafted by the American people. And here you see a campaign poster, Uncle Sam pointing out, saying, we need you, FDR. You are being drafted. And so his party, the Democrats, draft Franklin D. Roosevelt to be their candidate. It's a very savvy, shrewd campaign message uh, that the president, just like an 18-year-old, is being drafted uh, into service for his country. Well, he's opposed by Wendell Wilkie. Wendell Wilkie is a very charismatic, strong political candidate. He garners a lot of votes. He's a tough opponent for Roosevelt in 1940. Uh, but nonetheless, Roosevelt still wins the election handily. And here you see the Electoral College map uh, of 1940. And as you can see, Roosevelt is winning uh, across the country by a substantial uh, margin. Well, with the 1940 election behind him, Roosevelt is looking at the world. And this is a globe that was built for him by the War Department. And this photograph is, uh, uh, is a value for looking at Roosevelt, because Roosevelt is a grand strategist. He looks at the whole world. He doesn't just look at one theater. He looks at how one theater is connected to another theater. He sees the connections between Europe and Asia. What goes on over there is connected together. They're not separate theaters. They're linked together. And so Roosevelt has a global perspective. By the way, a second globe was built. Uh, the second globe was given to Winston Churchill and now exists in his country home, Chartwell, uh, outside of, of London. Roosevelt wants the U.S. to be strong and support those countries fighting the aggressor states. So uh, in 1941, early 41, the U.S. government, uh, Congress approves legislation for Lend-Lease, provides supplies, food. Uh, to those countries fighting against uh, aggressor states, to Britain, to China, and as we'll see in a moment, the Soviet Union as well. Well, stymied, not able to beat Britain in 1940, Hitler turns east and goes against his partner Stalin, attacking the Soviet Union. The invasion begins on June 22nd, 1941. Hitler's ambition is to defeat the Soviet Union quickly. Again, why? well, to destroy the Soviet regime, but also to garner the resources of the European portions of the Soviet Union. The Ukraine breadbasket, the Donbass region that is currently fought over in eastern Ukraine, uh, coal is there, food, coal, and into the Caucasus to get oil. Germany, with these resources, will be able to build up its military power for a war with the United States. Uh, how can Germany fight the United States? Well, it needs more resources. It has to be stronger. Just as Japanese militarists want Manchuria, they want resource-rich areas to increase their power, to become greater powers. Uh, Hitler's Germany is doing the same thing uh, uh, here. 
to gain more resources to be able to be successful in waging a global war against Britain and the United States. Well, in August 1941, Roosevelt and Churchill meet together off the coast of Newfoundland in a summit meeting. Um, again, this is August 1941, before our entry into the war. And uh, here you have Roosevelt and Churchill on the battleship Prince of Wales, which brought Churchill across the Atlantic for his meeting with Roosevelt. And there, Roosevelt and Churchill discussed what are British and American aims in the world, but also how, how to deal with these aggressor states, Japan and Germany. Behind uh, Roosevelt and Churchill, you see two American admirals. To the right, Admiral Harold, nicknamed Betty Stark, who is our chief of naval operations uh, at this time in 1941. And behind Roosevelt is Admiral Ernest J. King, who at this point is in charge of American naval forces in the Atlantic. In 1942, he becomes the chief of naval operations uh, when Admiral Stark goes over to Europe uh, to take over control of American naval forces in European waters. So here Roosevelt and Churchill are meeting with their top political, uh, some top political leaders. You see Avril Harriman in the background, Harry Hopkins as well, uh, and military leaders <clears throat> to chart uh, the future course of the war. Again, this is August 1941. Uh, important document comes out. And here you can see newsreel. This photograph is part of a newsreel of a religious service, Sunday service, that's held on the deck of the battleship Prince of Wales. You see the president and uh, Winston Churchill, the prime minister, sitting in the uh, service. By the way, this battleship Prince of Wales will be sunk by the Japanese on December 10th, 1941. It was sent out to the Far East, to Singapore, after uh, uh, this meeting, and uh, would get sunk by Japanese land-based naval aircraft operating out of southern portion of Vietnam from the region around Saigon, attacking across the South China Sea, to sink this battleship uh, and the battlecruiser Repulse uh, uh, just a few days after Pearl Harbor. Well, one of the big achievements of the Atlantic Summit is the Atlantic Charter. And here you see the whole Atlantic Charter, uh, eight paragraphs. It is publicized, it's not secret. Uh, it's signed by Franklin D. Roosevelt and Winston Spencer Churchill. Uh, and when you look at the document, it puts forward British and American war aims. The U.S. isn't in the war yet, but we've already laid out our aims. Article 6 of the Atlantic Charter calls for the final destruction of Nazi tyranny. Again, we would call this regime change. U.S. isn't even in the war, but we're calling for the end of the Nazi regime because Roosevelt, a very hawkish leader, uh, and Churchill have come to the conclusion there could be no genuine peace in the world while the Nazi regime exists. Uh, they're quite right in that regard. Uh, and they're laying this out as a, a war aim for the United States and Britain. Japan is not mentioned specifically by name, but it is also highlighted as an aggressor state that has to have its conquests rolled back and has to become demilitarized, disarmed after the war. These aggressor states have to be disarmed so that they won't again, again, uh, cause uh, wars of aggression. Um, uh, this uh, uh, highlights here already what Roosevelt is thinking about what the post-war world would have to look like. Um, later on, he would proclaim unconditional surrender. Well, it's, it's already uh, being prefigured here in the Atlantic Charter. Well, what do the American people think about this? Um, the Atlantic Charter has been promulgated. Roosevelt sends a message to Congress uh, that explains the Atlantic Charter. Well, the American people are asked the question by Gallup, uh, do you think the U.S. should enter now into a war with Germany? You can see the polling data. 74%, three quarters of the American people say no, they don't want to go to war with Germany. No opinion, 5%. Uh, then Gallup asks another question, which is to say, okay, uh, what is more important, that the U.S. keep out of war or that Germany be defeated, even if it carries the risk of the US getting into a war with Germany. Defeat Germany, almost 60%. Stay out, almost 40%. No opinion, 5%. Um, what, what does this opinion poll show? 
Uh, well, I like to joke and say, well, it shows that 5% of the American people are clueless. But beyond that flippant remark, uh, what you see is the American people understand that a war with Germany is going to be costly. It's going to require a big commitment of American forces to Europe, a number of casualties, loss of life, great deal of treasure. Um, uh, and they want to avoid that if they can. But on the other hand, they also recognize that Nazi Germany is indeed a danger and they want to see it defeated. In that sense, the Atlantic Charter captures almost 60% of what the American people think, which is that Nazi Germany has to be defeated in this war. The Nazis have to be removed from power. Uh, at the same time, it also shows while the U.S. wants to see Nazi Germany defeated, they want somebody else to do the fighting. Britain, the Soviet Union, Lend-Lease, the Arsenal democracy, that's what you want to do. Uh, keep America's military role fighting limited in some way. Well, we know that that's not possible. Without the big infusion of American military power forward deployed into Europe and across the Pacific to Asia, that Germany and Japan uh, cannot be defeated. Well, American opinion at the same time is asked about what's going on in the Pacific. Should the U.S. take steps to keep Japan from becoming more powerful, even if it means risking war with Japan? Almost 70% of the American people say yes. And again, they've been conditioned by four years of war watching Japan uh, attack China, the Japanese atrocities in China. So the American people are willing to take a hard line against Japan. Again, only a small percentage, less than a fifth, are saying no. Uh, again, the American people uh, want to see a hard line against Japan because they understand the danger posed by Japan. Another important turning point of the fall of 1941 is that the U.S. and American leaders and President Roosevelt understand that there's a nuclear arms race going on at this time. The Second World War is the first nuclear war. The first nuclear arms race is in the Second World War. On one side is Britain, the US, Canada. On the other side is Nazi Germany. And the big fear that American British leaders have is that Nazi Germany, Hitler, will get nuclear weapons before the Americans or the British. Uh, the British put together a study, a group of scientists, engineers, to look in the feasibility of developing nuclear weapons. Uh, this is known as the Maud Committee. Uh, and uh, this is the, some of the conclusions of the Maud Committee. They say that it's going to be very costly to build this weapon, but the impact uh, of these weapons, the destructive effect, both uh, in material terms, uh, but also in psychological terms, it will be so great that every effort should be made to produce these bombs. It's expensive, but it could be decisive. Uh, despite the expense, uh, uh, the US uh, and here Britain should try to develop these weapons. Again, when can a bomb be built? The committee concludes that it's feasible to develop a uranium bomb and they might be ready by the end of 43. Again, we know the history. It takes the summer of 45 before the weapons are ready. But at the time, in 1941, British scientists, engineers were thinking it could be accelerated. It could come sooner than that. Again, the British committee also says, even if the war ends, before these bombs are ready, no great power is going to want to be without a nuclear weapon. To be a great power requires that you have nuclear weapons because you will be insecure if another country has nuclear weapons and you don't. So uh, this is uh, a weapon that uh, you're going to want to have to preserve the peace after the war is over. Well, one of the main recommendations, one, uh, a bomb is feasible and it can have decisive results in the war. Again, that highest priority be given to uh, 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 trying to obtain these weapons as soon as possible. And that Britain should collaborate with the United States to uh, acquire uh, these weapons. Well, the Maud uh, Committee report is given to the Americans by the British government. Uh, it is briefed in the fall of 1941 to Roosevelt. Roosevelt had already been alerted to the danger of nuclear weapons by uh, an important letter from uh, Einstein. Uh, so he understands that these weapons uh, have the potential to exist and how destructive they can be and the fear that Nazi Germany might get these weapons. So after being briefed about this, he writes to Winston Churchill and says, your committee, uh, 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 we have to talk about this uh, and we ought to be taking actions jointly 
to coordinate our efforts to develop these weapons. Churchill responds uh, to Roosevelt's uh, letter uh, by saying, yes, uh, Britain wants to cooperate. So before Pearl Harbor, before the US entry in the war, Roosevelt and Churchill have committed themselves, the resources, to a major research and development effort, and then very soon uh, to the actual acquisition of these weapons. Well, let's go back to the Pacific, uh, to the danger posed by Japan. Well, after the fall of France, uh, uh, American leaders uh, look and say, what role can Japan play in the larger war in Europe? Uh, again, that the Pacific theater is connected to the Atlantic, the European theater. Uh, it is that Japan could strike north, the so-called Northern advance against the Soviet Union. If Japan strikes north against the Soviet Union, it will tilt the balance of forces in Europe against the Soviet Union. Hitler will be able to take Moscow if Soviet forces are tied down in the Far East fighting, fighting Japan. Russia, the Soviet Union, Soviet Russia actually moves its forces from the Far East when it becomes clear Japan isn't going to do this to the European theater. And these forces from the Far East are critical for stopping Hitler from taking Leningrad and Moscow in the late fall of 1941. Again, Japan can help Hitler do better win in Europe if it attacks the Soviet Union in Northern advance. Uh, it can also tilt the balance of power, global balance of power, by striking south against the British Empire. If Britain has to divert forces to the Far East to defend its empire in Asia, to defend Australia, the result will be that Britain will have less forces available to fight in the Middle East in the Battle of the Atlantic and also to defend the home islands and to provide support for the Soviet Union against Hitler's Germany. So Japan's actions can have a, a, a big impact on the European war. And that's where Roosevelt is coming from. And that's why you have to, I, I say that Roosevelt is a global strategist. He understands how Japan can help Nazi Germany do better by these offensives north and south. So in June of 1940, as France is going down to defeat, the American fleet in the Pacific battle fleet had been in Hawaiian waters uh, on maneuvers. They were supposed to come back to the West Coast. Instead, Roosevelt says, stay forward deployed in, Pacific, in, in Hawaiian waters to act as a forward deployed deterrent of American naval power against Japan. Um, and here you see the battleship Arizona as part of the American battle line on these maneuvers. At the Naval War College where I teach, various scenarios, plans for how to fight Japan were gamed out uh, on the game floor here of Pringle uh, Hall in uh, Newport, Rhode Island. Um, American war plans were being drawn up uh, throughout this period for what would a war with Japan uh, look like. Well, the war plans that were on the books in 1941 uh, could they be executed? Well, the admiral who was in charge of the Pacific Fleet in Hawaii, uh, uh, Admiral uh, Richardson, he looked at the war plans and said, hey, these war plans, as he says, are predicated on a Navy that we'd like to have. But the reality is the Navy isn't up to the job of executing these war plans. Um, he wants to see the American battle fleet withdrawn from Hawaii back to the west coast of the United States, where he believes he can better train up the fleet, increase its readiness for war against Japan. That's his argument. He wants to bring the fleet home to the west coast. Uh, Roosevelt disagrees. Richardson comes back to Washington uh, to brief the president, give his point of view. Uh, it, it gets very uh, argumentative. And uh, Richardson, in fact, is quite rude to the president, uh, saying that the president is wrong in his uh, assessment of the strategic situation. Roosevelt uh, loses confidence in Richardson. Uh, by the way, Richardson had lost confidence in Roosevelt. And the result was that Richardson is relieved of command. And Admiral Kimmel takes over in command of the Pacific Fleet in his place. Now, on the other side, Japan, Japan's Admiral Yamamoto, his war plans. Uh, he's the mastermind behind the attack on Pearl Harbor. Japanese war plans were to strike south, to garner the resources of Southeast Asia, oil, tin, um, so that Japan will become stronger and able to fight the United States and to complete its defeat of China 
And so Japanese offensives to take Wake Island, uh, Guam, the Philippines, and also Malaya uh, and the Dutch colonial empire with its oil of Southeast Asia. So Japan is going south. That's where American planners and British planners are focused, where the Japanese offensive will be. But Yamamoto adds in something else, an attack on Pearl Harbor on this advanced base and the naval forces stationed there. Japan enters this war with six large fleet carriers. All six of these carriers are dedicated to this strike on Pearl Harbor. There are no large fleet carriers for all these other offenses that Japan undertakes. Yamamoto takes something of a risk there, but he wants the strongest possible naval air force available to strike at the Americans in Hawaiian waters. Um, just before the attack on Pearl Harbor, the Army-Navy game of 1941 played uh, uh, in Philadelphia on South Broad Street, uh, what was then called the Sesquicentennial Stadium, now uh, demolished, of course. And here you see on the cover of the Army-Navy game program, you see uh, the Corps of Cadets, the midshipmen, uh, standing proud and tall, carrying their banners forward. Um, if you went inside the program, on one page you would see this. The battleship Arizona that I've tried to highlight throughout this talk. And it says, here's a bow on view of the Arizona plowing into a big wave. And it's significant, the caption says, this is the caption underneath the photograph, that it's significant that despite the claims of air zealots, those who think the aircraft will be the dominant weapon, that no battleship has yet been sunk by bombs. Wow, if this isn't creepy. Of all the battleships in the U.S. Navy, the Arizona is highlighted in this program. Why not the battleship Pennsylvania or Maryland or Colorado? Instead, it's the Arizona that's highlighted. And we know the history. The Arizona on December 7th, 1941, is going to be struck by a bomb that penetrates into its magazine and causes an explosion, catastrophic explosion, that destroys the battleship Arizona. Uh, uh, what the ancient Greeks would call hubris and arrogance. Uh, and of course, those that are arrogant in a great tragedy are brought low by the gods. Again, this is so creepy to think that here this battleship Arizona is being highlighted in the program of the Army-Navy game, and just a few days later is going to be destroyed by the Japanese. Well, the Japanese carriers close in on Pearl Harbor to launch their attack on December 7th, aircraft being launched from the carriers uh, to go and strike the Japanese flagship raising signal flags that says, every man must do their duty. Again, uh, a riff on Admiral Nelson at the Battle of Trafalgar, the British, famous British Admiral of October 21st, 1805, but also the same words used by the victorious uh, Japanese Admiral Togo over the Russian fleet at the Battle of Tsushima in 1905. Again, the Japanese are harking back to their defeat of Russia in an earlier war and having the same battle cry as they go in to this battle with the Americans. Well, the first bombs start falling on Pearl Harbor. Battleship Arizona, its magazine lit up, explodes. Battleship wrecked beyond repair. And there are memorial to it uh, today. Here's the New York Times headlines of the next day, December 8th. On December 8th, President Roosevelt goes to ask for a declaration of war to a joint session of Congress. Here's the first page of the speech that he is to give. His speech writers gave him a first draft. Um, the speech itself is very short. Um, you can see the president marking up that draft. Uh, and here, the first sentence, you can see that the speech writers have given him yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in world history. Boy, that's awfully vanilla. That has to be spiced up, gingered up in some way. And so you see Roosevelt taking his hand to it, taking out uh, a comma, putting in dashes instead, and inserting that word infamy. The Japanese attack is infamous, dastardly. And so uh, what we know as the day of infamy has very much Roosevelt's personal imprint. That's the word that he used, that he imposed on this speech. He's now internalized it, he owns it. Well, 
while the United States declared war on Japan on December 8th, we did not declare war on Nazi Germany. Instead, on December 11th, 1941, Hitler goes to the Reichstag and asks for a declaration of war against the United States. Reading Hitler's speech, you see why. He gives the rationale for why Germany goes to war. Uh, he highlights that Roosevelt has insulted him personally through the years. Uh, that from 1937 on in that quarantine speech, the president has singled out Germany and Japan as aggressor states. Uh, this so-called president has been insulting to the Fuhrer, the leader of the German people. But he goes on to say he can't feel insulted. Why? Because Roosevelt, like Woodrow Wilson, the American, the other American president that took a, the United States into war with Germany, they're mentally unsound. Uh, again, a, a, an attack, a personal attack on Roosevelt. Uh, now, why is Roosevelt a so-called president? Well, because we know Roosevelt doesn't really control things in the U.S., Hitler says. Wh who really does control U.S. foreign policy? It's not the elections. It's not the president. It's a group of international Jewish financiers. They're the ones that really call the shots in the U.S. Roosevelt is a marionette in the strings that this uh, cabal pulls are what makes Roosevelt act. And so um, Roosevelt uh, is taking harsh steps against Japan and supplying uh, Britain and the Soviet Union against Germany. Why? Because he's being told to do this. Um, Japan has tried to negotiate with the US, but instead Roosevelt has been deceiving them and humiliating them. And so now Japan is going to strike out. again. Roosevelt, this man, this so-called president, harbored one desire. And what was it? To bring about a world war. Roosevelt is not a man of peace. He's a warmonger. And Hitler is saying that he's the man of peace, really. It's Roosevelt who is the bad guy here who wants to see world wars. Now, why does Roosevelt want that? Uh, because the United States aims at global hegemony a world dictatorship run by the United States, run by this international Jewish financiers, this cobble, this small group uh, that, that um, uh, controls American politics. Germany and Japan are fighting against this global domination of the US. This is what Hitler explains to the German people and to the world why Germany is declaring war at this time. Hitler also had strategic reasons as well. He wanted to see the United States tied down in the Pacific rather than move its resources over uh, to Europe. Um, reading Hitler's speeches are revealing, very revealing of Hitler's worldview, which we find fantastic and crazy, unrealistic. And yet, because he believes it, it has a reality. When your enemy has entrenched views, ideology. It has to be taken seriously. They believe it. And hence, you have to take seriously what they say. Well, uh, here's Roosevelt signing the Declaration of War on December 8th, 1941. And uh, on December 9th, he gave a fireside chat to the American people. And he says, in the last few days, America has learned a terrible lesson. And what is that terrible lesson? Again, it's what he said in the quarantine speech, that the Western Hemisphere is not immune from the contagion of war that spreads, and that the U.S. can't measure its safety anymore uh, by measuring miles across oceans. War can come to the United States if the U.S. isn't engaged with the rest of the world. Roosevelt is trying to make clear to the Americans that their security is caught up with the security of other countries that are like-minded and are partners in the world against aggression. Well, um, Roosevelt, uh, in April 1945, he sent for a portrait. And here you see a photograph of him on the day before he died in April 1945, uh, and the portrait that is unfinished that was being made of him. And you can see how the ravages uh, of war on his physical well-being. He ran for a fourth term in 1944 as president. His doctors told him before the election that he shouldn't run, that he will not live out the fourth term. The stress of being president in wartime is just too great. He ignored their advice, ran for presidency, won a fourth term over Thomas Dewey. 
uh, and as the doctors predicted, uh, it uh, led to his death uh, in April of 45. Um, again, when I look at this photograph of Roosevelt, I think of the famous photographs of Lincoln in 1860 and 1865, just what a physical toll uh, wartime leadership has in these existential struggles uh, on our leaders, uh, the stress that's involved. Uh, that leads, of course, to a physical deterioration uh, as well. Roosevelt, though, believed he had to go on to serve his country in wartime. And with that, I conclude uh, my remarks and uh, I, I'll take whatever questions uh, that you might have uh, in the question and answer uh, uh, box uh, up there. And I'll stop the share. How's that? Um, John, some of the questions are in the um, chat box. Oh, okay. Let me go over there as well. Okay. Um, let me start with, I, I went to the Q&A. Let me go to that one first, uh, uh, involving the USA uh, and Asia. Uh, uh, do you think the main, the beacon of arsenal democracy in the area of China? Uh, very good question. I think the pandemic has shown how dependent, uh, Larry, how dependent we are on supply chains around the world and how we have to uh, build up, uh, build up our uh, capabilities here, become more self-sufficient uh, in developing uh, what we need to be successful uh, in the strategic sphere. Uh, we've become economically so dependent on other countries and, and that might make a lot of sense from an economic perspective. From a strategic perspective, we have to protect ourselves a bit more. Uh, there's another question that just come in. I'll go, I'll go to Chad in a moment. Why did Japan not attack Russia? Uh, good question. Japanese military leaders thought about it. Uh, the Japanese foreign minister at the time wanted to do that and pressed for it. But in 1938-39, Japan and the Soviet Union fought uh, an undeclared border war with each other. And the Soviet Union, the Red Army, uh, beat handily the, uh, the Japanese army in that fight. Uh, also, Japan's army leaders, uh, they didn't think that they were prepared to fight the Soviet Union at that time. They're heavily tied down against China. And the Navy is saying we should strike south to get resources. The Japan needs those resources to be uh, competitive in the long run. Uh, whereas the resources of, of uh, the Soviet Union in, uh, in East Asia, in the Far East, they're not as tangible as the oil of uh, Southeast Asia. So the Japanese leadership decides to go on the so-called Southern advance rather than the Northern advance. Uh, by the way, Hitler by 42 and 43 is asking the Japanese to attack the Soviet Union, but they don't. Uh, from 1941 to 45, to August of 45, Japan and the Soviet Union have a non-aggression pact with each other. They're not at war with each other. So Stalin, stays out of the war in the Far East until August of 1945, when he breaks the non-aggression pact and attacks uh, Japan. So Japanese military leaders, the army leaders, didn't want to attack the Soviet Union at that time. And so they favored the Southern advance to get the resources of Southeast Asia. Let me, let me go over to the chat um, uh, uh, function um, to look at that one. Um, um, uh, thanks for general, uh, not ready, please. Yes, that's important. Yes, in the chat room, support FBRI. Um, um, uh, again, uh, great power war in Asia. And uh, yeah, there it is, all of this in the in chat. Um, let me go down. Um, uh, again, uh, appreciate uh, the thank you. Um, DOV aggressor states, do you see any historical parallels to today with respect to actions taken by Beijing and Moscow? Um, yes, uh, one thing that's very important is the US as a global power is caught up on separate fronts. You know, we might want to pivot to Asia just like Roosevelt wanted to pivot to Europe in 19, uh, uh, because he saw Germany as the main enemy of the US. Nonetheless, you can't ignore those other theaters. So if we want to give emphasis to China, we can't also ignore Putin's Russia, or for that matter, Tehran in the Middle East. Uh, the US has to think about how to balance uh, forces, its capabilities 
between these uh, 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 various um, uh, theaters of, of war, uh, and also the danger of those states cooperating with each other, that if fighting starts over Ukraine, that, uh, that gets our attention, that that could then be something that leads to conflict in, in Asia. So for the United States to deter war, we have to think about deterring war in all three of these theaters. And uh, the question is, do you have enough uh, military capability uh, uh, to, to go around? Uh, Alan Luxenberg, hey, thank you very much. Capital, I, I'm glad we're using capital now uh, again, and in capitals. Um, um, Hitler projecting in much the same way, uh, 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 again, you know, Hit Hitler um, sees the United States as its ultimate most dangerous enemy of Nazi uh, uh, Germany. Um, let me go down again some more uh, and read this. Uh, was willing to risk Pearl Harbor to get the American people in the war. Th this is something, uh, this question, a very good question by uh, 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 Timothy. Um, did Roosevelt know about Pearl Harbor attack? Uh, and the answer is no. Um, we knew from breaking the Japanese diplomatic cipher that war was imminent. A war warning was sent out to American uh, forces commands that war was imminent, that Japan was going to go to war. We knew that. Um, uh, indeed, we were able to see that Japanese troops were being put on transports and were going across the South China Sea to attack Malaya and capture Singapore. That they were on their way to landing, attacking the British Empire. Again, aerial reconnaissance showed that the Japanese were about ready to attack in Southeast Asia. So we're all focused on Southeast Asia. We're not focused on this Yamamoto swing to attack uh, Pearl Harbor. Um, we knew that war was imminent. We didn't know that Pearl Harbor was going to be attacked. Um, we had broken the Japanese diplomatic cipher, but at this point, we didn't have any luck against the Japanese naval cipher. We didn't know what Japan's operational plans would be. Fast forward a few months, we break sort of the Japanese naval cipher, and that helps us to understand that Japan is going to attack Midway. But even then, uh, it, it, we're only getting something, some of the words, not the whole messages uh, that the Japanese naval cipher is going out. So it, it's, it's hard to read that Japanese naval code even before Midway, and we have no visibility on it uh, before Pearl Harbor. The Japanese task force that went from home waters across the North Pacific down to Pearl Harbor to attack at Pearl Harbor exercised radio silence. Uh, there were no signals coming out from there. So uh, uh, radio traffic uh, signaling uh, to try to track them didn't exist. We didn't know where the carriers were. We assumed that they were supporting these Japanese offensives out in the Western Pacific. So um, didn't know about it. We thought that, uh, Pearl, uh, that, that the Philippines would be attacked, that Malaya would be attacked, that Guam would be attacked, but, but not Pearl Harbor. There's no evidence to show that we thought Pearl Harbor was going to be attacked. Um, let me see what, what else is here. Um, uh, here's some more over in the uh, Q&A. Um, why can't humanity learn the lessons of history? Uh, yeah, uh, we study history uh, uh, here at the Naval War College. Uh, we believe that studying history is one of the best ways to prepare uh, leaders of the future. Um, and it's history that you seek to apply to understand today's environment, the dangers that are out there, the strategies. Um, Roosevelt as a leader was a student of history. Uh, he liked to read naval history. As a teenage boy, he was handled, handed by his mother, Alfred Thayer Mahan's influence of sea power upon history as a Christmas present. Uh, this is a very dense read, by the way, Mahan's influence of sea power. But Roosevelt loved it. Uh, as Assistant Secretary of the Navy, he wrote to Mahan, had a correspondence with him. Again, he studied naval history. So Roosevelt studied history. And I think that's one of his strengths as a leader is that because he had studied history, he understood how you can learn from the experience of others. Uh, you can learn from the past and apply it uh, uh, to, to today. Um, uh, another question, uh, 
examples of whether Germany, uh, Japan or Germany acting on a request for an action by the other. Um, uh, Germany and Japan uh, communicated with e each other uh, about uh, uh, their strategy and what they were going to do. At the same time, though, they often caught their, their uh, ally by surprise. Um, uh, Japan, for example, um, uh, got little warning about Hitler's attack on the Soviet Union. Uh, Japan attacking the U.S. while it was com uh, communicated uh, to the Germans. Again, it comes rather late in the day. So uh, both of these countries don't coordinate their strategy uh, as, as well as they might have. The history of the Second World War could have taken a dramatically different turn if, uh, highlighted earlier, they had struck the Soviet Union uh, in the summer of 1941. Um, or if uh, Hitler's Germany had not attacked the Soviet Union, but had continued to keep putting pressure on Britain. There are uh, alternative scenarios here where they could have cooperated better. Um, the German and Japanese alliance doesn't cooperate as well as the United States, Britain, and the Soviet Union and China cooperate during the Second World War. For all the dysfunction in the grand alliance of the US, Britain, China, and the Soviet Union, it, it looks much more coherent than uh, Nazi Germany and Imperial uh, uh, Japan. Um, yes, climate change. Uh, again, you know, what are the common threats that are out there? Um, Roosevelt and Churchill are looking to a post-war world where uh, uh, humanity, Larry, as you're saying, uh, is, is looking for cooperative ways to solve uh, global uh, problems. Again, they're not concerned about climate change at, at that time. Um, I, I, again, uh, to Lisa here, uh, um, the, um, uh, the, uh, 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 the FDR didn't know about the attack on Pearl Harbor. He knew about an attack on, was likely to come to the Philippines where General MacArthur is and to Southeast Asia. But Pearl Harbor was not uh, considered far enough away um, that Japan would not be able to attack uh, Pearl Harbor. Now, what's remarkable about that is that American planners had gamed out and done exercises where carriers did attack Pearl Harbor in the 1930s. Uh, so it was seen as feasible in some way, but it was seen as a little too, too far uh, fetch. Um, with regard to the publication of the book, uh, I wish it could come out sooner, <laughs> uh, but it will be coming out uh, uh, in the summer of, of next year. Um, I, I, Raleigh, I don't know if there's uh, anything else, but I, I think we're coming close to our uh, uh, end yeah. time here. Well, uh, John, this was just tremendous, a marvelous talk. And as evidenced by the many questions and comments uh, a lot as, to quote Alan Luxemburg, yes, a capital talk, <laughs> really terrific. So thank you so much. And we really look forward to your book coming out. This is, I think, whetted everybody's appetite. So we really appreciate you being here today. And to our audience, uh, thank you for sticking through and uh, for your great questions, your super audience. And thank you again for your support. Uh, there aren't many think tanks that offer programs such as this. And uh, this, this was just tremendous. So um, uh, we appreciate your support and we hope you'll keep it coming. And uh, happy holidays to all. And if we don't see you again, happy new year. Um, thank you again, John. Uh, thank you, Raleigh. And thank you to everyone.